Jerry E. Smith, he along with a George Picard, are the authors of a new book out now called Secrets of the Holy Land, The Spear of Destiny in History and Legend. And uh, Jerry is a writer, editor, an activist. Uh, he was close uh, associate of Jim Keith, uh, the author of Black Helicopters Over America, Strike Force for a New World Order, uh, and several other uh, conspiracy books. Uh, Jerry, I'm, it's a real pleasure to have you with me here today. Uh, tell me real briefly, if you could, what, what got your particular interest aroused uh, regarding the uh, Heilige Holy Land? Right, uh, Heilige Lanza. Heilige uh, Lanza. Yeah, uh, well, I read Trevor Ravenscroft's book when, when it first, uh, first came out back in the early 70s and was impressed with it. And curiously enough, I was actually in a monastery at the time I read it, so it was uh the uh, the uh, the occult and and past life stuff was was very real to me at the time and so uh i i kind of filed it away and then um uh i uh, i i'm uh, one of the writers for adventures unlimited press and uh, our uh, owner david hatcher childress called me up one day while i was working on on my current newest book which is weather warfare the military's plan to draft mother nature and i had been working on that book for a number of years and that book was like seven years in the research and two years in the writing and i'm going to be, very, just... very, inter- I'm going to be very interesting to interested to talk with you about that because i was writing about weather modification back in the 70s and you can imagine how advanced they are with it now and like right oh, here in absolutely. Texas this summer, you know, it's uh, here it is almost July the 4th, and it should be hot and dry, and instead it's rained for a month. It's uh, very, very unusual. Yeah. Actually, uh, I believe that that is uh, the telltale of a uh, a hurricane prevention shield that was thrown up last year, which is why we had zero hurricanes hit the U.S., and I think we're going to have the same thing this year. But the problem is, in order to make the, the shield work, you have to have a persistent dome of high pressure, which inside the high pressure you get uh, um, hot baking conditions, and outside you get uh, uh, weather systems stalled. And so the weather systems that should be passing over Texas, dropping a few sprinkles, are um, are being stopped and and, uh, and emptied before they can move on. Oh, so uh, anyhow, I... Nice. Uh, uh, yeah, maybe you, you back to the Heilige Lands. <laughs> yes. So, uh, uh, David, uh, David gave me a call, uh, September 05. No, September 04. And said, hey, uh, uh, I've been selling these two books by, by Howard Buchner, and I've been selling these two books by, uh, um, uh, uh, Ravenscroft, and I'd like to just get rid of all of them and have one book that combines them all into one book. Can you do that for me? And I said, gee, wow, that sounds like a great plan. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. And he said, great, I want it in six months. And, I, and uh, it took me two years to write my first book for this company, which was Harp, The Ultimate Weapon of the Conspiracy, and I knew there was no right. chance I could I could crank out a book in six months. So I, I immediately uh, uh, tagged George Picard. George Picard is a... Uh, CIA mind control operation paperclip expert. He wrote Liquid Conspiracy, the CIA Area 51 UFOs and LSD. And uh, I uh, I got him to write the Nazi segments, and then I wrote the uh, the ancient history and the uh, and the urban legends about the, the Antarctic base uh, around his writing about the Nazis. Well, I got, I have to say that you've done a commendable job here. This. Uh... Uh, it, your book is all over the map. It goes all the way back to Tubal Cain. It comes all the way forward to uh, 9/11. Uh, it's it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, so how much collectively? How much time did it take you all to put that together? Well, David gave me six months, and I had the manuscript to him in seven. So wow. uh, George and I each spent about six months on our halves. So it took collectively about 14 months to, to, to write a book and deliver it in, four, in, in seven. Well, you've done a very commendable job, and I might add that it's a very readable book, too. I mean, uh, but you certainly cover all bases. Um, my question, my first question is, is um, do, you, do you have any hard evidence that Charmaine possessed the Spear of Destiny? Charlemagne. Um, Charlemagne. Uh, 
Yeah, um, uh, the, the hardest evidence is that um, uh, both we have uh, eyewitness accounts. Uh, uh, the uh, the Bishop of Tours wrote it at, at great length. And then we have um, uh, the hardest of hard evidence. We have coins that show Charlemagne with uh, the, the Spear of Destiny. Uh, that it's I think clearly is clearly identifiable. Uh, it's identifiable. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, uh, he made it very, uh, very pointedly a big piece of his reign, and partly because Charlemagne, as the king of the of the Franks, had had uh, the the Franks were uh, the the people who eventually gave us France and Germany today. The Frankish people were two major divisions of the Frankish people, the, the Merovingians and the Carolingians. And right. Charlemagne was the king of the Carolingians, and the, he fought and defeated the king of the uh, Merovingians. And uh, if you're, I know you, you know uh, a lot of the wild stories about the Merovingians. They, uh, they oh, claim yeah. to be descended, descended from Jesus. And they had, uh, the king of the Merovingians had a tribal spear, that is that when he possessed it, it gave him the power of life or death over any Frank. And Charlemagne came up with the Jesus spear, which trumped the um, the, the the Merovingian tribal spear. And wow. I, I, my best guess is that the the object that is in Vienna today uh, is probably, almost certainly, Charlemagne's spear, and Charlemagne hoaxed the world by saying it was the Jesus spear. Uh, he, in fabric, he fabricated one, right? Exactly, exactly. Because uh -huh. there had been, there had been a, a Jesus spear in the in the in the Byzantine Empire. It, it existed from Constantine to Justinian, and then vanished for several hundred years. And then it well, turns up uh, with, uh, with with Charlemagne. And uh, right. in two in two thousand and three. The British metallurgist Dr. Robert Feather was permitted to test the the Vienna artifact, and he concluded that it was in fact a a Carolingian winged spear that had been forged in the sixth or seventh century. Clearly, could not have been used in the crucifixion. Right now, the well, the, the wild this... twist on this is that, according to Howard Buchner, the the uh, uh, Heinrich Himmler had um, uh, Japan's greatest swords maker come to Germany during the war and make an exact replica of the real spear and had it intentionally made out of Carolingian era materials so that if ever tested it would prove to be bogus. Uh, this, uh, this I think is a wild twist and, and Buchner said this in the 70s, um, you know, he wrote in, uh, excuse me, in the 80s, he wrote in 89, 88-89. And it wasn't until 2003 that it was tested and proven to be Carolingian in origin. Fascinating. I think we should break right here, though. I should have done this earlier. For those listeners who might not have a clear understanding of exactly what the Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny is, why don't you give us a synopsis of uh, exactly what we're talking about here? Okay. According to the Gospel of John, as Jesus hung on the cross, uh, the uh, soldiers were sent to break their legs so as to hasten their death. And the soldiers broke the legs of the two common criminals and came to break Jesus' legs. And at that point, a centurion stepped forward and pierced his side with, the, with his spear. And according to John, out came blood and water. Uh, Christian mythology has grown up around this thing and said that the, uh, the, the centurion uh, was Gaius Cassius Longinus, or Longinus, he uh, was an elderly man, uh, had, had, was, had, had cataracts, was going blind, and was on light duty, basically Red Squad deal of, of following Jesus around and reporting back to Pontius Pilate on his activities, and had come to appreciate, perhaps even, even worship, uh, Jesus. And when, uh, when uh, uh, Jesus was already dead, and, and uh, uh, Gaius Cassius Longinus or Longinus had stepped forward to show that he was dead, so you don't have to break his legs, you don't have to mutilate the body, which is a, a, an act of disrespect. And in doing that, piercing the side of Christ, out came the blood and water, which cured him of his cataracts and converted him to Christianity at that very moment. Now, a, a, um, a legend has arisen that whoever possesses this holy lance 
and understands the powers it serves, holds in his hands the destiny of the world for good or evil. Either way. So in other words, Longinus' action was one of mercy, perhaps even love. Exactly. And, uh, and uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, this makes, this makes the, the spear a relic of the passion. And relics are a universal constant. Virtually every religion on this planet reveres relics. And the, and, and the idea of a relic that has somewhat dropped out in Christianity, we don't have them, have, have them quite as important as they were, say, a thousand years ago. But uh, the, the idea is that the relic is not merely a memento of the saint or prophet, but, is, uh, but, the, but the, the, that which made the saint or prophet uh, into the saint is, is the supernatural. And the, the, uh, uh, the idea here is that, is that you visit the, the shrine of a saint in hopes that, that some of that supernatural power that made him a saint will come through and positively affect you. And so it's believed that this, that this spear, because it pierced the side of Christ, is imbued with the supernatural power, and that it can be wielded by, uh, by someone who understands how to do it. Right. I think the key there, though, is can be wielded for good or for evil. And we'll get into that uh, and right after these messages. Under no circumstances miss Linda Howe's report at the end of this program. It is also offered as a special report in position 5 in our Windows Media Player. Do not miss it. It is a terribly important report on the crop circle phenomenon, probably the most important report on this phenomenon that anyone has ever done. Do not miss this. Howdy, this is Jim Mars, and we're back here on Dreamland talking with Jerry Smith about the Heilige Galant or the Holy Spear or the Spear of Destiny. Um, and Jerry and his co-author, uh, George Picard, have uh, made a intensive study of this, and if you have any interest, I would highly recommend uh, their book, The Secrets of the Holy Lance. Jerry, we were talking that the lance, down through legend and, and story, uh, wields great power for whoever holds it, and you uh, and George have done a masterful job of showing that the various uh, possessors of the spear indeed were pretty successful in their campaigns to uh, enlarge their empires or, or whatever. Um, you've also, of course, brought up the fact that apparently the spear that is now on display at the Hapsburg Museum in Vienna is not the legitimate spear. What has happened to the real spear? Wow. Two, uh, two great areas. Uh, one, the, the powers that the spear seems to uh, endow on its wielder, and the other is... Well, let's is, talk well, about that. Uh, let's, let's talk about that for a moment. Uh, what are your okay. thoughts on these powers? And, and uh, it seems like, from your accounts and others, that uh, it could be wielded for good or for bad. Exactly. Well, the, uh, the, uh, the historical record says that there are half a dozen, there's a suite of, of powers that this thing has associated with it, which is invincibility in battle, uh, precognition, uh, clairvoyance, clairaudience, uh, divine inspiration, divine guidance. Uh, uh, the, the, the clearest example of the use of this suite of powers is, is Constantine the Great, Constantine had all of these powers endowed, uh, uh, given to him uh, at his command when, when he wielded the spear. Uh, when he first wielded the spear, uh, uh, he was uh, uh, the politics of ancient Rome is incomprehensible by any standards of today, and, and so I spent uh, I spent uh, months I, I, I spent almost three months working on figuring out what the heck was going on. And, and, and understanding it well enough to be able to explain it to my readers. And I ended up writing a, 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 a great deal more than actually ended up in the book. The way George and I worked is that each of us would, would, would first draft our section and pass it to, to the other. When George gave me his chapters, I would add to them. When I gave George my chapters, he subtracted from them. 
<laughs> so uh, about 30 pages of Constantine stuff got it ended up on the cutting room floor, I'm afraid. Right. Um, Constantine uh, apparently acquired the spear as a wedding gift when he married the daughter of uh, the co-emperor. There were two emperors, and then they decided it would be, be a good idea to have four emperors. Well, this promptly produced seven or eight emperors, and Constantine ended up fighting his way through the lot of them to become the emperor. And in the process of which, uh, in, in the initial battles, he was vastly outnumbered. Uh, some scholars say he was outnumbered as many as 10 to 1, and yet won every battle with, with hardly a scratch. Um, then there's the, uh, the, uh, the, his famous vision. So, so it's the first thing that was that was in, in um, uh, 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 his famous vision is he yeah he, explain his vision if you would for the listeners because this is very crucial uh, apparently in the uh, establishing Christianity as the predominant ab- religion in ancient Rome absolutely absolutely prior to um, prior to this. The, the official Roman religion was a, a, a pantheon of many, many gods, and the, the average Roman really didn't have much of a relationship to any particular god. It was Gods were rather like landlords. You had to propitiate them. You had to pay them regularly, or the well would dry up, or the, or the crops wouldn't grow. But they, they didn't really revere or love the gods. It was just, you know, um, something they had to do. Kind of like um, paying taxes. Exactly. And uh, and Constantine, as emperor, was the was the supreme pontiff, the uh, uh, the, the head of the of the of the state religion. So whatever he was, everybody else had to be. And he was initially Sol Invictus, the the, uh, the, the victorious son cult, uh, and got converted to Christianity uh, because of his vision. And his vision was. Uh, there was a really awful movie called Constantine and the Cross with um, uh, Cornell Wilde that came out around 61. And they got everything wrong except for the pronunciation of the names. <laughs> but that's, that's the standard view. And most Americans know about Constantine and the Cross from the movie Constantine and the Cross, which they got everything wrong. So absolutely which, hilarious. Well, which, is, um, which is pretty par for the course. In fact, I, I venture to say that... Uh, most of the beliefs of modern America were largely shaped by Hollywood. Exactly, and Hollywood is incapable of getting it right. So, um, um, Constantine did not see a cross in the sky. He saw um, a uh, an odd figure. It was called the Labrum, and it is uh, the first two letters in the, in the name of Christ written in the Greek alphabet, and it says capital P crossed by a capital X, a very odd object. Uh, after he had that vision, and not only did he have that vision, which is which is um, uh, clairvoyance, uh, he also heard a voice tell him, "With this sign, you will conquer." With that clairaudience, these are these are supernatural phenomena. Um, he then ordered the uh, the labyrinth to to be marched uh, uh, to to be crafted into objects to go on the on the tops of all the of all the flags. And uh, uh, you know, on top of all the flagpoles, and be marched in front of his uh, his army. There's a story that that he had all the soldiers paint the, the symbol on their on their shields and so forth. But I I don't think that really happened. Uh, I I think it's just a uh, a uh, you know uh, 1800 years of, of telling the story wrong. Right. But uh, he definitely did have it marched at the at the head of all his armies, and his armies were victorious when uh, when they marched behind it. Um, when he got let me to ask Rome, you, let me ask you this, Jerry. Do you feel like that Constantine's conversion was legitimate, or did he just simply latch on to Christianity since he, as a matter of political convenience, and the fact that he probably figured out he wasn't going to be able to stomp it out anyway? Uh, a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Um, uh, one of the things he did is that, uh, uh, as I was telling, that the, the next thing that happens is the is the spear talks to him and tells him that Rome is no longer the right place to have his capital, and he needs to move it. And the spear tells him to move it to this odd little old Greek town called Byzantium. And he does, and he renames Byzantium Nova Roma, New Rome. After his death, the uh, the inhabitants rename it Constantinople after him. And then after the Turks took it over 1,400 years later, they renamed it Istanbul. 
Now, uh, uh, in in uh, Nova Roma, he had built uh, a number of, uh, of cathedrals, uh, 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 temples, and in one of them, where he's buried, where his his uh, coffin is, um, he has uh, statues of the twelve apostles circling his statue with a statue of himself, making himself the thirteenth apostle, which I think mm-hmm. is is. Uh, is, is, is sort of hilarious. Uh, apparently, Constantine had an immense ego. One of the largest statues ever constructed by humans is a statue of Constantine, in which all that's left is the head, and the head is 22 feet tall. Wow. Um, he, <laughs> yeah, he definitely had an ego problem. Um, uh, um, uh, also, while he's laying out Nova Roma, uh, the spear is again talking to him, and he kept uh, insisting to anybody who was listening, and then, of course, he's walking around in this giant entourage, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with all these court officials telling them, we're gonna put a, we're gonna put a temple here, we're gonna put a park here, we're gonna put a gymnasium here, and as he's laying out the city, he keeps telling them that it's the spear that, that is telling him to do this, and, and he kept saying, I am walking in the footsteps of him who goes before me, in which he's trying to tell them that Jesus is leading him around in the, in, in, in and laying out the new city. Mm-hmm. So there you have a, a, a bundle of uh, invincibility in battle, clairaudience, clairvoyance, etc. Um, uh, Charlemagne, who we began the conversation with, Charlemagne was convinced that it gave him uh, uh, precognition. That uh, with, uh, with it, he said that it gave him visions of battles before he fought them, so he knew how to fight them. And with the spear, he won 49 out of 49 battles. We know, Jerry, that sounds incredibly similar to uh, the uh, remote viewing that was studied scientifically and then practiced uh, operationally by first by the CIA and then by the United States Army and then on into the National Security Agency. Right. I'm, do, I'm not do you sure see how the same mechanism they were involved in. here. It, it's uh, uh, it's precognition. Well, now, no, re- yeah, precognition is is what makes what makes seers, is what makes prophets, is what makes Nostradamus. Uh, With remote viewing, you're, with remote viewing, you're actually trying to, to, to tune and use this as a, uh, as a tool. It's not just a matter of being hit by visions, but by being to, to conjure up the vision and, and right. direct your, your gaze where you want it to go. That's true, but, uh, you know, Nostradamus himself gave his technique, which was to sit alone at midnight and stare into a bowl of water and when he would get these uh, mental images, which is, uh, to me, very similar to what the uh, U.S. Army was doing with its remote viewing. I think we have the same process involved, but just different interpretations and different terminology. Uh, yeah, we'll continue this. We'll continue this uh, right after this. Howdy, this is your host Jim Mars. We're back here on Dreamland, and we're talking with Jerry Smith about the uh, Holy Lance, the Spear of Destiny. Uh, we've been talking about how it could be tracked uh, all the way, actually back past the time of the crucifixion, and then on forward through uh, Constantine and Charlemagne. And uh, Jerry, tell us how it ended up in the hands of Hitler. Now, this is a good story. Now, uh, one of the things we didn't get to in the last segment was that there are multiple objects that are claimed to be the sphere. And right. so there is there is one that Hitler got, and one that's in Armenia, and one that's in the Vatican, and one that's in Poland. Um, the, the, all, the, the various claimants, uh, their provenance, their, their chain of custody, goes back to that first centurion who pierced Christ's side, uh, Longinus or Longinus. Uh, there are many stories as to what happened to him after the crucifixion. Uh, in one story, he stays in the Holy Land, um, uh, becomes a devout Christian, uh, achieves Christian martyrdom in the Holy Land. Uh, his spear stays there and is on display until the Arabs overrun uh, Jerusalem around, was it, 600 A.D., and then it disappears for about 400 years. And then there was a, a, the caliph, uh, who ruled all of Islam, died, leaving two sons and no clear heir. And one of the sons, uh, the, the sons fought each other over who would, be, who would be the caliph, and one won and one lost. And the loser bugged out and went to the Knights Templar, and this is how the Knights Templar get, get wrapped up in the Holy Land story. And the, the, the Knights quickly realize that, that he's too hot for them to handle, and they pack him off to Rome, and they give him to the Pope. 
Now, the, the winning brother, meanwhile, realizes that the, the losing brother knows a lot of stuff that he does not want the Pope to know and offers to buy his brother back and ends up buying him back in one of the greatest ransoms ever paid which and to sweeten the deal threw in the Holy Land. The uh, the Holy Land gets to, uh, to, to, to the Vatican as part of the exchange with the losing brother. And then for the next couple of hundred years, the, uh, the folks in the Vatican bicker about whether it's the real deal or not. Finally, one of the popes, around 1200, 1300, I forget when, um, um, just got fed up with all the disputation and said, okay, we're going to stash this thing to where you're all going to shut up about it. And uh, he had a, a decorative roof built over one of his um, uh, thrones, and the direct de- decorative roof is supported by four pillars, and he had walled up inside one of the four pillars the Holy Land, and that's where it remains to this day. That's the one in the Vatican. Then there's another one in Armenia, and this story goes that after the crucifixion, uh, Longinus went east following the footsteps of Paul and died in uh, what is now Turkey, and uh, that uh, spear turns up uh, during the crusade being discovered by Bartholomew and ends up today in a small monastery in Armenia. There's a, another book about the Holy Lands that came out about six months ahead of our book uh, uh, called Secrets of the Spear uh, that was published in England. And that one, uh, the author, um, Ian McClellan, is convinced that the, uh, the object in Armenia is the real deal. And, uh, frankly, I can't see it because the object in Armenia clearly is not a spear. It is a, a standard head. It's a flagpole top. And, uh, and how a flagpole top could be the, 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 the spear of the Christ is completely beyond me. But Ian, uh, Ian paints a pretty good argument for it. Uh, and then there is the object in, in Vienna. And it's hard to say, as, as we began our conversation, uh, saying that it could have been faked by Charlemagne. In, uh, Charlemagne used it to be um, uh, crowned the uh, first emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, and he, and he used it in the ceremony on Christmas Day, 800 A.D. So that, that spear may have first appeared publicly about that time. However, the story goes that Longinus became close personal friends of Joseph of Arimathea, who was a tin trader, and the tin was in England, or Britain. And uh, Joseph and uh, uh, Longinus go to Britain. Uh, Joseph founds Glastonbury Abbey, um, plants the hawthorn tree, and begins uh, Christianity in the British Isles. And the, the spear passed to possibly to Queen Bodicea, who is probably the first person to be invincible in battle as long as she had the spear with her. But she was taken by, by Romans in her sleep. Um, and then the spear disappears for a couple hundred years after her to turn up in the hands of St. Maurice. Now, I know we don't have time to tell the St. Maurice story, but after St. Maurice and his men, his legion of 6,660 men were martyred by Caesar, uh, the spear uh, ends up with, with Constantine, and I suspect that um, uh, that the, the Caesar who martyred uh, uh, the Theban legion, uh, St. Maurice and his men, was the, was, was con- became Constantine's father-in-law. And I believe that the, the spear was given to him as a uh, trophy for the, the murder of the, uh, of the Theban legion, and then he passed it on to Constantine. And from there, it remained uh, a, an heirloom of, of the Byzantine royal household from Constantine to Justinian, where it again disappears for a few hundred years and then turns up in Charlemagne's hands, where it becomes a, an heirloom of the uh, um, Holy Roman Empire and remains with the Holy Roman Empire for a thousand years. And that The Holy Roman Empire was the first Reich. It, it lasted from 800 A.D. to 1806. And... Uh, it and it uh, in the it went through a number of emperors um, and had a number of changes made to it. The the uh, I, I don't know how much time we have here to to, to tell this piece of the story, but um, uh, eventually it it went on it, it throughout the time it was in the Holy Roman Empire it was on dis, on public display most of the time. So millions of people saw this thing over a thousand year period. 
And this may have been where its magic powers really came from, if it does indeed have magic powers. And that I asked the question, you know, are we just meat or do we have souls? Are we imperishable spirits or just uh, just uh, what, what, what once, once through? If we have power, what kind of powers do we have? How can we affect objects? You're probably familiar with uh, psychometry. Uh, psychometry is the uh, 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 science, if you will, uh, of the psychic technique of uh, taking an object, uh, having a psychic take an object and then learn things about the person who who held that object, such as a, a guy's uh, uh, pocket watch leads a, a psychic to, to find his body. You still with me? Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, it, it, uh, so um, uh, I'm wondering if perhaps uh, um, millions of people looking at this object and believing it is the Spear of Christ, believing it has supernatural powers, might not have actually impressed some powers into them. Then again, we have the question of, uh, of uh, the, the legend of the lands is that whoever understands the powers it serves holds in his hand the destiny of mankind. And there's a lot of talk about powers. Um, indeed, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, a Gallup poll from, uh, I think, 2003 found that 85% of Americans believe in angels. 65% of Americans believe in devils. These are powers. What, what if indeed a power sees this object and realizes that it could be a doorway for, the, for, for this entity to reach through? Did, 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 did Hitler claim the spear or did the spear claim Hitler? Interesting. Right, so and those of course, are some H of the things. Hitler so, first came into contact uh, when he was just a student in, in Vienna, right? Right, that is, that is the story that uh, around 1907 or 1910, when he's living in flop houses and has been rejected by, by, by the art college and is trying to, to make his living uh, painting watercolors and postcards in the, in, in the square, uh, one day he went into a fit of rage. Now, now we actually jumped a point here. It was on display in Nuremberg for the last from 1400 to 1800, and then um, Napoleon marched on Nuremberg, and the Nuremberg[ers] were convinced that if Napoleon had the spear, he would rule the world with it. So they they put it into hiding. Well, it, while it was in, it was given to uh, a, a certain nobleman who wasn't all that noble. And when the uh, 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 empire fell, he realized that there wasn't any legitimate claimant to it and sold it to the Habsburgs, who, who ruled uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And so the Habsburgs then put it in their, in, in, in their museum, along with uh, a, a lot of other... Uh, it was part of the uh, treasure of the uh, our Holy Roman Empire, which included some, some uh, crowns and shields and swords and things. So um, it was in... Uh, it had been in Vienna... Uh, from about 1811 on, and um, uh, was uh, was seen by Adolf uh, after it had been there for about 100 years, around 1907 or 1910, and he had gone into a, a fit of rage one day, tore up his paintings, and, and this was a late fall, blustery afternoon, and just to get warm, went into the closest public building, which turned out to be the museum, and he's wandering in a funk through the building and is stopped by a, a tour group in front of a glass case, and here's the tour guide tell them that that in the, in the case is the Holy Lance, and that a legend has arisen about this thing that whoever whoever possesses this Holy Lance and understands the powers it serves holds in his hand the destiny of the world for good or evil. After the tour group moves on, Hitler comes up to to the glass case to see what the heck is this is all about, looks at the lance, and is suddenly transported back in time to a thousand years earlier. And he feels that he is one of the great kings of the Holy Roman Empire. He's one of the great German kings using the spear to command and control his empire. And then comes back to himself in modern-day Vienna, dressed in rags, wondering what the heck just happened to him. And that sent him on a, 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 a personal quest, which, uh, according to Ravenscroft, ended with him becoming initiated into the black art. And uh, and falling under the spell of uh, of uh, uh, occultists who uh, used uh, uh, who initiated him and, and made him perhaps the greatest black magician of the age. And these were uh, members of the Thule Gesellschaft or the Thule Society, right? Or or uh, and the Real Society and a couple of other groups. There yeah, were, there were a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, there was a lot of activity. Uh, the 
the, the New Age movement really got off the ground about the time of the American Revolution in, uh, in, uh, in Central Europe with uh, Madame Blatty and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and there, was, uh, there was numerous mo- uh, 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 spiritual, uh, parapsychology, uh, neo-pagan movement taking place at the time. And, and the, uh, the, the, the SS, the, uh, the, what became the SS, kind of balled them all together. Right, and of course it's been documented in many books and documentaries about how that uh, Hitler's Reich was based on occultism. Uh, we're gonna when we come back after this break, let's talk about where the Lance is today. We'll be back right after this. Howdy, I'm Jim Mars, and we're back here on Dreamland speaking with Jerry Smith, the author of Secrets of the Holy Lance, and uh, we've been having a rapid uh, Cliff Notes version of history bringing the Lance on up to the time of World War II. Jerry, tell us, uh, in your best opinion, what, what actually happened to the real Lance? Well, you know, I don't really know. Uh, I, I like the stories. In fact, I tell the stories. And there are so many stories, so many threads. Uh, it, uh, you know, that at the beginning of this, my, uh, my co-author, George Picard, and I had, uh, had some really wild conversations and that George believed that Jesus was a historical figure and that it's very possible that this object could exist and could have some sort of metaphysical connection to the, the, the divine. On the other hand, I don't believe that Jesus was an historical person. So I don't think he ever existed. I think that Christianity is a cruel joke. Uh, uh, and so um, we we went round and round on, on how to approach these various aspects. Um, so I don't think any of them are the real deal. Uh, George well, us, is... Okay, tell, so us, the, tell us about the recovery of the lance in Antarctica. That's a fascinating there you go. story. That, that is really, that is really the, 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 the most amazing and wonderful part of the story. Um, we know that during the war, uh, Heinrich Himmler was intensely interested in the Holy Land. That right. Heinrich Himmler found a, uh, a castle, uh, a three-pointed, a three-sided castle, the only three-sided castle in Europe, and attempted to uh, build a, uh, a Spear of Destiny um, uh, university around it. Uh, and the, the initial work that he did, uh, that he accomplished, was to turn that castle into a spear castle in which every room in the castle was uh, appointed with things owned by previous owners of the spear. So the Frederick Barbarossa room really had things that Frederick Barbarossa actually owned. So it would have been one of the most spectacular and expensive collections in human history. And in the basement of it, in the in the in a dun, in a deep dungeon, they they conducted arcane black magic occult rites using um, a replica of the spear. Now the story goes that uh, what 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 we know from history is that there was the Anschluss, the uh, the union of Germany with Austria, and during the the Anschluss, the um, the Reich treasure, which included the Spear of Destiny and the, uh, uh, the, the, the crowns and jewels and so forth, were removed from Austria and returned to Vienna and put on display. Uh, this included the Holy Land. Now, there's a great deal of debate as to whether Hitler kept the Holy Lands on his person for a while or not. Remember, one of the powers it supposedly gives you is invincibility in battle. And it was it was with uh, uh, it was a few months after the Anschluss that World War II began, and uh, his uh, his initial uh, blitzkrieg across Europe may have been the uh, the result of have, of wielding the spear. Okay, well, now the you know you mentioned goes, yeah you mentioned earlier that Himmler, who we know had a deep fascination with the spear, uh, brought in this Japanese spear maker and had an exact replica made. Um, and according to some, some of my sources, uh, there was this uh, conflict between Himmler and Hitler over who was going to actually possess the spear. And I think that's why Himmler had the duplicate made. And the question becomes, did he keep the real one and give the duplicate to Hitler, or did Hitler get the real one and he kept the duplicate there at his castle? That's a, that's a darn good question. That is a darn good question. The, what we know of the, of the, of, of the switcheroo and, uh, and recovery comes from 
what is probably one of the most elaborate hoaxes of the 20th century. But if true, it's really amazing story. And this goes, um, in, uh, there was a professor of medicine at Tulane and LSU, uh, uh, Dr. Howard Buchner, who had been a surgeon battalion, uh, U.S. Army uh, battalion surgeon during uh, World War II, and uh, uh, he was approached by a German submariner in the mid-1980s uh, who told him this incredible story that the, uh, the, the spear in Vienna was a fake, that, the, that Hitler had ordered, uh, that Himmler had had an exact replica made. It was the replica that went on display in Nuremberg and was re- later recovered by the U.S. Army and then given to, 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 to Vienna and that the real one was sent by submarine to Antarctica. And the submarine, uh, the, the submariner who approached uh, uh, Buchner claimed that he was one of the sailors on that submarine and that uh, uh, among, the, uh, among the, uh, the, the people being transported was uh, Martin Bormann, uh, Hitler's personal secretary, and his entourage who got off in Patagonia before they went on to Antarctica to bury the spear. And that this, the, the sailor then goes on to say that in 1979, he helped a, 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 a group of Nazi occultists recover the spear and claimed to have photographs of the objects that they had recovered, um, the, the log of the expedition that did the recovering, and so on. Um, Buchner checked this out rather thoroughly and became convinced that the submarine was telling the truth, that this, this was what really happened, and wrote two books that are now long since out of print. And mm-hmm. that's part of how I ended up writing Secrets of the Holy Lands was that uh, uh, my company, Adventures in Unlimited Press, was selling the two books and we were running out, and we needed um, uh, some, uh, you know, we couldn't get any more of them, so we needed to have a new book that then encompassed this material. So in, in researching this, I discovered that, that there were all these urban legends about a Nazi permanent base in Antarctica, and that Admiral Byrd had actually gone down and had a battle with the Nazis after the end of the war. This, uh, this story is that uh, uh, there was a, uh, an operation called Operation High Jump in 1946-47, and it was the largest armada ever sent to Antarctica. Cap, uh, uh, Admiral Byrd had at, a, at his um, uh, command a brand-new state-of-the-art aircraft carrier, a submarine, two destroyers, and several dozen aircraft, both uh, rotary and fixed-wing. Uh, uh, there was more than, than 4,700 men, including 3,500 Marines in full battle gear. They went down to Antarctica equipped for an eight-month stay and, there were, and were there 16 weeks and suddenly, without giving any explanation, came home. Uh, there have been rumors ever since that they engaged the Nazis and lost. Uh, so in, in, uh, in telling that part of the story, I, I, I said that's, that's where the, the other three months I spent writing the book went. So the, uh, the, their base in uh, Antarctica, which I believe they referred to as Agartha, um, he, but as I recall in your book, you said that this Agartha was probably um, deserted back sometime in maybe the late '60s, early '70s. Right. That was that was our best guess. Um, uh, what we what what we can say from from uh, official government records, uh, from 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 the the known realities, if you will, is that. Um, the claimed site to where, where they stashed the, the uh, spear and or where the Nazi base, possibly named Station 211, was located, was in the Mulig Hoffman Mountains of uh, German Antarctica. And uh, this is the part we, we kind of missed out. During the Anschluss in 1938, the Germans also claimed a major piece of Antarctica, about a fifth of the continent. Um, they sent a, an expedition down in 38-39 that uh, took 11,500 photographs and dropped thousands of, uh, of Nazi flags claiming that, that region for, for, not, uh, for, for Germany. And it's quite possible that they had a plan to um, put up a permanent colony there because they discovered some ice-free regions that the Mulligan Mountain Range had a, had an ice-free zone, um, probably caused by uh, by geo- geothermal vents. What um, what we know today is that spot is currently off limits uh, under uh, U.S. law, 
a uh, it is a declared an Antarctic site of special scientific interest, and only by uh, uh, petitioning the governing body of uh, of the Antarctic zone can you get into it, because it's claimed that it is a bird breeding a bird breeding ground, and they don't want humans disturbing these birds, and so there is um, the the site is ringed. With um, uh, stations, the uh, the Norwegians have a station just outside this uh, site of special scientific interest in SSI, and uh, uh, on the coast is a British site, a, 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 a South African site, a French site, and a Russian site. So there's an awful lot of interest in this area, and um, and they have nailed it down where you simply can't go there. Period. So uh makes you wonder if they're if they really are protecting the birds or protecting some secret. Right. Seems like an awful lot of effort just to protect some birds. Mm-hmm. That's, so, that, that's what George and I thought. So if the um, Buckner story is correct and they recovered the Holy Lance from Antarctica, according as I understand the story, then it was turned over to a secret Nazi occult group which then formed themselves into the Knights of the Holy Lance. And they are still exactly. holding it, probably somewhere in Europe, don't you suspect? Oh, absolutely. In fact, uh, uh, George decided to try and figure out who currently possessed it. And his um, his take was that it was, um, I'm just going blank. I hate it when I go blank. Um, um, uh, Voldheim, Kurt, Kurt Voldheim, uh, former um, uh, uh, Secretary General of the United Nations, and, and he was forced uh, prime... to resign. Yeah, he was forced to resign as president of Austria when they found out that about his Nazi background. Right, he was a, a senior SS officer uh, who had uh, whose unit was was okay. his unit had uh, had committed horrible crimes. And though right. he claimed he didn't, uh, uh, he was on leave at the time. Well, uh, and let's not let's not forget that Kurt, one of Kurt Waldheim's best closest friends was is now the governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Mm. And Schwarzenegger's father, uh, I believe his name was Gustav, uh, was a Nazi party official. So, uh, you know... Well, uh, we, uh, Volheim like just that, died a, a week ago. So right. the, the fear may have changed hands. So uh, what we're finding here is that although World War II ended uh, 60 years ago, uh, the legacy of the Nazis lives on. And, uh, the shoes are still falling. Right. And particularly when it comes to the fabled Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny. Jerry, thank you so much. We, it, it, this, this time has just flown by. We've barely been able to hit the high points and, and missed even some of those. I certainly appreciate your time today. And I know the listeners are just entranced with all this information and with the work you've done. Uh, if you want all the details, see Jerry Smith and George Picard's book, Secrets of the Holy Land. And till next time on Dreamland, this is Jim Mars saying adios. Linda Moulton Howe has a an truly an amazing report for us today. What is happening in England in the crop circle world is completely unprecedented, as unprecedented as what has been happening in Northern California with those amazing photographs of the drones. The crop circle experience and the crop circle phenomenon have exploded in some extraordinary and also some disturbing ways. Linda Moulton Howe's website is earthfiles.com. Now more than ever, don't miss a single day of earthfiles.com. Here she is from Albuquerque, Linda Moulton Howe. Thank you, Whitley. Early Saturday morning around 1.35 a.m. on July 7, 2007, that 070707 day, a paralegal professional now working on a linguistics degree at Cardiff University in Wales traveled with his girlfriend, Paula Presby Jones, to the top of Knapp Hill in Wiltshire, England. Gary has been fascinated by crop formations for the past 10 years and says that he gets intuitive hunches maybe a couple of times to go to Wiltshire. And when he has followed those hunches, he has had the good fortune to walk into fresh formations. Knapp Hill, which is where he felt he had to go, on the early morning of Saturday, July 7th, 
overlooks the famous East Field owned by the Tim Carson family, where some of the most outstanding crop formations of the past quarter century have appeared. This summer, the big field was planted with wheat, and another crop formation researcher named Winston Keach from Yorkshire, England, had also decided that he needed to go up to the top of Knapp Hill for his own night watch, and he had five cameras set up when Gary and Paula got there at 1.35 in the morning. There were two at Winston Keach's Jeep, about 200 feet down from the top of Knapp Hill, and he had three more cameras on tripods on top of Knapp Hill. Now, why was Winston Keach on Knapp Hill with so many cameras and recorders? Well, 15 years ago, in 1991, Wynn Keach had a close encounter with a ball of light that created a crop circle right in front of his eyes, and it happened, he said, in three seconds. Winston was standing in one of the corners of the East Field. A ball of light the size of a human fist appeared right in front of him and suddenly expanded to be like a big floating pancake about 20 feet in diameter. And then the wheat below this golden-colored floating pancake, started to wave around and then laid down in a perfect circle. The pancake that was up in the air then retracted back to the size of a fist and slowly drifted away into some bushes and disappeared. And the fact that it took only three seconds so astonished Winston Keach that he kept that eyewitness account to himself. At the time, he had only one single reflex camera and a very old video camera, but he said he did not even have time to push a record button. It all happened so fast and astonished him. And he felt that whatever that light ball was that turned into a floating pancake was teasing him and telling him, as he said in his own words, I'll show you what I can do. You cannot catch me on film, but I am here. And that challenge is what provoked Winston Keach every single summer since 1991 to go down to Wiltshire for a couple of weeks, setting up his equipment, improving it every year to focus on the field at night, trying to catch that phenomena on video. Well, what happened the night of July 7, 2007, at Knapp Hill and the East Field might be one of the most important events in crop formation history. At 1.35 a.m., Wynn Keach showed his cameras to Gary and Paula, who had arrived also, and he panned the East Field with his Sony light-sensitive camera and recorded video that showed the field was absolutely dark and empty with only some well-known streetlights in the small village of nearby Alton Prior. The weather was cold and very windy with occasional rain, and the three people sat down under a tarp, and they went into a discussion next to three of those cameras on tripods, and they began talking about realities, other realities, and other dimensions, a subject that always comes up in night watches among crop formation researchers. Suddenly, at 3.08 a.m., That's recorded on one tape. All three people were startled when a bright white flash of light, like a huge camera flash, they said, lighted up all of the east field and the surrounding land. And there was no sound. It was not lightning. It was not thunder. Something strange had occurred. And Winston Keach realized while the three were deep in conversation that he had forgotten to check the tapes. He ran down first to his Jeep and found that the tapes had run out. And one of those was an infrared lens camera that might have caught the bright flash of light. He changed out the tapes and went back to the top of the hill to check on the other three tripod cameras. By 3.20 a.m., 12 minutes after the big flash of light, Wynn looked at the East Field through his Sony VX2100 light-sensitive professional digital camera and thought he saw a shadow. Gary and Paula looked also and said there was definitely a shadow in the middle of the field that had not been there earlier. Wynn Keach decided to videotape at that moment from Knapp Hill, and 
by 4 a.m., Gary and Paula drove down to the east field as the light was coming up, and Wynn Keach videotaped them from atop Knapp Hill as they went into the east field and became the first humans on this planet to put their feet onto nearly 100 circles at least. Some are so small that no one has ever gotten a successful count yet. And Gary told me that when he put his foot down in one of the circles, that it sounded and felt exactly like he was stepping on crystal that broke and crunched. Now, this particular formation that is making history is so massive that it's estimated to cover 96,600 square feet. That is equal to covering 2.25 acres, and some of these 100 circles, which are spread out in a very strange design, range from only about 2 feet up to 160 feet. The range of circles is incredible, and the whole pattern that came down in the dark, in the wind, in the cold, on July 7, 2007, somewhere between 1.35 a.m. and 3.20 a.m., 1,033 feet long and 490 feet wide. There's been a tremendous amount of analysis. There was a press conference on July uh, 18th uh, in, or July 19th in Wiltshire, to announce to the British press what has happened and the fact that this is a formation that seems to fall into a category in which no one, no one can say that humans in that field were involved, that something truly extraordinary has happened in the East Field and there were three people and some cameras to give some hard evidence. And you can go to my news website, www.earthfiles.com, and see the infrared videotape, the early morning images that were taken. But what I want to share today on Dreamland is what has been happening since this amazing formation occurred in the East Field. No one has ever seen so many military and dark completely unmarked helicopters ever over the East Field. The helicopters have swooped down on people in the field, causing radiation meters to rise sharply, and people have smelled an odor that makes them very nauseous. They have vomited, and their eyes are burning. This week, I talked with longtime crop formation investigator Andrew J. Buckley, a professional graphic artist from the Manchester region of England. He has been concentrating on the East Field since the big July 7th event, keeping his videotape running as the military helicopters have appeared. And he begins with what happened to him on Monday, July 16th. When I arrived at what's known as the, the salvage pit, which is just off the east field, I was actually on foot as I was walking down the road. I noticed there were some vehicles parked. They were what I describe as white vans. They were unmarked. There were three of them. And there was a person standing by one of the vans, and I could see in the field somebody in the formation, and I assumed that they were from the, the vehicle. So I walked past the van, and I was about to walk into the field, and the person who was standing by one of the vans came up to me and, and said something to the effect, excuse me, where do you think you're going? And I said, well, I'm just going to have a look at the formation. And he said, you do realize it's private property. Uh, and he said to me, that I'm acting on behalf of the farmer, and that there's some kind of exercise going on at the moment, so would I stay out of the field? I kind of said, well, all right, but can you tell me what's going on? And he said no. Andy, did you ask him who he represented? He wasn't dressed in uh, military fatigues or anything. He was wearing kind of... He looked rather official. So at that point, I kind of mentioned... The farmer, I, said, I mentioned that I knew Tim Carson, and he didn't really respond. He said he hadn't heard of anybody called Tim Carson. Uh, but um, <laughs> um, I, at that point, 
I kind of, I was getting a bit sort of fed up with this, so I thought, right, well, well I'm just going to go in the field and see what reaction I get. So I walked towards the field, and he kind of walked towards me and kind of blocked my way, and I said, you'd be sort of ill-advised to go in there at the moment, and all I have to do is to ring the farmer. And I said, well, I know the farmer. You know, you, you've just kind of denied that you know him. I tried to draw it into a conversation about it. What I've written down, I've written some notes in my notepad. I wrote these down after um, it had gone. And he said that there were personnel, he used the word personnel in there, that were, they actually returned while I was standing there. These guys came out. I saw them walking back down the tram lines. And they, it was rather strange. There were about, I'd say, four or five of them. And they appeared to be wearing the same gear, and uh, which, which looked rather odd. They were wearing what I describe as white coveralls. And when they got actually out of the field, they were carrying samples. They'd obviously taken plant samples out of the... They were carrying um, wheat and stuff they'd put into bags, and they were carrying these things. And they went to one of the vans and opened up the back and put them in the back. One of the guys was carrying a lot of equipment that looked to me like either photographic equipment or possibly some other equipment. They didn't speak to me. The chap who I spoke to earlier seemed to be the commander-in-chief. He was telling them what to do and getting the van and everything else. Before he went, I, I kind of made a last attempt to draw him into conversation, but he wasn't having it. But he did say before he went, he asked me if I knew whether anybody else was likely to be coming in the formation that morning. And I said, why are you asking me that question? And he said, well, you'd be advised to stay out of it because there was going to be some kind of military, he didn't use the word exercise, but military activity there, and he'd be advised to stay out. I said, what kind of military activity? And he just completely ignored me, got in the van, and they all drove off. So at that point, I went back into the formation. I've got a device with me that measures radiation levels, the dose rate meter, which I always use to test if there's any kind of residual radiation or something. So when I got in the formation, I was just sweeping it around and didn't really notice anything significant. So I sort of hung around for a while. I walked down the field and walked back again, looked around. And I stayed around about 9.30. Then the military activity began, which he predicted. And there was a lot of helicopters. There were Apache helicopters, Lynx, Gazelle. And they were all circling, kept continually the, uh, the East Field, more than normal. That went on for an hour. By this time, there were quite a lot of people come to look at it. By the way, I recorded all this on video. So about 11.30, one helicopter appeared. It was a gazelle. It came down the valley very low. It took up a hovering position above the formation, stayed there for a while. And then it dropped down and started making very, very low, low-level passes over the formation, all over the people in the formation, including me. It was very intimidating. And at one point, it was almost landed in the formation. It was extremely low. This went on for, and I've got it on the clock from 11.30 till 12.30. Going towards 12.30, it was still there, and it moved over towards Nap Hill, dropped down, and then came very, very slowly across the field at ground level. And as it got to the formation, it rose slightly in the air and hovered, and almost immediately, well, it, it hovered for several months, probably about a couple of minutes, but almost immediately, myself and together with a few other people started to feel very unwell. It came on very, very suddenly, coincidentally, when this helicopter appeared. I started to get a headache, a very strong headache, felt quite nauseous. My mouth was very dry and my ears were popping. And I immediately noticed there were two other people standing in the same circle and I noticed they were behaving rather strangely. So I went across them and I said, do you feel very unwell? And they said, yeah, that's strange, isn't it? The helicopter, by that point, had gone. Andy, did you see anything sprayed in the air from that helicopter? No. This was on the Monday, but that was the prelude to what happened on the Wednesday, which is even worse. But <laughs> I um, had the dose rate meter on, and I noticed the readout on it had gone up significantly from zero to probably between 60 and 80. It was fluctuating. And what do you hypothesize that that helicopter had done over all of you? What was it emitting? Well, the only thing I can think of is I go back to uh, Freddie Silver because in his book, Secrets of the Fields, he noted a similar phenomenon. He was in a formation in the same field. And a black helicopter came over it and he felt, again, the same you know, symptoms, headache, nausea. And he put it down to infrasound. 
that's what happened on the Monday, but on the Wednesday morning... Which would be July 18th, correct? Yeah, Wednesday the 18th of July. I've been going in a formation every morning, really, just to monitor it. And on Wednesday morning, and at precisely 12.47, I looked down the valley towards Martinsville Hill, which is not that far away, and I saw three bright lights in the sky sort of in alignment, and they were kind of, appeared to be hovering fairly low down, just below the height of the hill, which is Martinsville Hill. And then I suddenly became aware that they were coming towards me, heading straight for, for the formation. And there were three helicopters. I've never seen these helicopters before. I'm used to most of the helicopters here, but these were very, very large, black, unmarked helicopters. And they were flying side by side, as they got, I'd say, halfway down the valley, they broke formation. The helicopter on the left moved towards the side of the hills. They were very low down. The helicopter on the right moved to the right, and the helicopter in the center carried on until they arrived at the formation. And then for the next, I've got it 12.47, I'd say for the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, all three helicopters circled the formation at very, very low level they'd occasionally fly back down the valley and come back again. And the helicopter in the middle came down extremely low. They were very, very intimidating. They were big helicopters. The only comparison I can make is a friend of mine who knows Gordon Stewart. He's an aircraft expert. One afternoon we went to, I think it was Middle Wallet, the Army Air Corps base, and we saw a helicopter very similar to one of these helicopters. And Dave said instantly, that's an SAS. Special Forces. The other two helicopters seemed to be maintaining, they were circling all the time, all the time around the formation, whereas the other helicopter would come down and hover and, and, and move over very, at a very low level. So I got a very good view of it. I uh, looked at it on the video. I cannot see any markings on it whatsoever. It seems to be completely unmarked, black and big. What was significant, though, they made, I think, probably about a series of three passes or whatever, there were quite a few people in the formation, and they were very, very scared by this. I mean, some people ran out of the formation. I mean, these helicopters were obviously very intimidating. But the final sort of uh, close encounter, if you like, the helicopter had gone back again. He came back down again. And on the third time, got exactly the same effect we had on Monday, except it was far more pronounced, except this time it was a lot worse quite severe vomiting, <laughs> wow. and I was throwing up quite badly, actually. There was a terrible smell. Describe it as being a cross between sul a sulfury smell. It was very, very powerful. It made my eyes burn, and I noticed quite a few people, maybe half a dozen people as well, they were quite severely affected. I saw one man throwing up in into the crop. I was actually shouting to these people to get out, which we did. The other thing was I got the dose rate meter, and uh, it had shot up very, very high, between three and 500, which are, um, it says on the alarm threshold is 275. If it goes higher than 275, that signifies there's a significant radiation risk, because this meter is used in, in nuclear power stations to measure radiation levels. If it goes above that level, it gives off a signal, which it was giving off at the time, meaning basically get out of the place. It's dangerous. And the implication is, Andy, that... These three large, unmarked, unidentified choppers were emitting something that made you vomit, but also that radiation would have been involved? It seemed like it, because this meter measures radiation. It was picking up very high levels, which dropped off quite suddenly when the helicopters disappeared. So that gave me an indication that it was tied in with the helicopters. Did any of you see actual physical spray of some sort coming from these helicopters? Well, the one that came overhead, I could smell this. I got the impression that there was something being emitted from this helicopter, but it was very difficult to determine. It certainly was, it seemed to be colorless. But, I mean, what happened later, in the same afternoon, a bit later on, an Apache helicopter started circling quite low. And as he moved over, he was not far away from us. We were in the salvage pit. He moved between us and Woodburn Hill. Something was dropped out of the helicopter, and it left a very significant, what looked like a pink vapor trail in the sky that came right down to the ground, and that stayed in the air for a while. 
back of the helicopter went. We both remarked that there's this funny smell. Yeah, we noticed it was definitely a, an, an unusual smell. It wasn't like normal smoke or anything. And two days after the July 7th sudden emergence of this massive formation in the East Field, Charles Mallet, who operates the Silent Circle Cafe, had gone into the formation and was uh, examining plants when he said suddenly the biggest, blackest, unmarked helicopter came suddenly swooping in right down. He said, Linda, it couldn't have been more than 50 feet above me in the field. And he said, I just had to keep telling myself, they're not going to crash these expensive machines and they're not going to strafe this field in midday in front of all of these travelers and these Wiltshire residents. But Whitley, what in the world could be going on that somebody with a military context is being this aggressive in Wiltshire on farmland, making people sick, vomit, eyes burning, uh, to have radiation monitors suddenly leaping up above uh, even normal in a nuclear plant, and what could be behind this kind of aggressive activity? Well, Linda, you know what the visitors, what one of them said to Colonel Philip Corso, probably the most important thing that has ever been said in the history of this whole phenomenon and our relationship with them, when he asked what was on offer for us, the answer were, was a new world if you can take it. And if I look back earlier in your story to the incredible story of this man, 15 years he's been out there, and there he and his friends are in the middle of a rainy, miserable night under a tarp. That's right. called taking it. That's called being there. And, and they come away with proof, with perhaps the best, most extraordinary crop circle story that has ever been told. And what happens then is the dark side of this emerges. It emerges because it's been hurt. It's been slapped across the face, Linda. And mm. it, it, with these people, it, it, my uncle, well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I, I, well, I will say that he's passed on now. He said that the people that keep the secrets turn bad, that it makes them bad. And that's mm -hmm. why he and Art Exon told their secrets, told me as much as they dared to tell me. And uh, poor Art Exon ended up with his phone bugged and his life ruined afterwards. Mickey was more careful, and that didn't happen to him. Um, but there is a dark side. And if you hide this, and if you're listening right now, and you are one of the people who holds these secrets. Do whatever you have to to help your own conscience, to help your own soul, because believe me, you have one, and you have placed it at extraordinary risk, at great risk. That is what I have to say to the ones who are doing this. They know who they are, and they commit a sin in under certain laws, a crime, and certainly that overused phrase, a crime against humanity, most assuredly. Right. Well, so what do you say to that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I said right, thinking we're yeah. probably out of time, but I, I mean. No, no, we've got a few more minutes. Was, we've got about four more minutes, to be exact. Yeah. I, uh, I'll give you my exact, honest, human emotion when I heard Charles Mallett tell me what happened to him, when I listened to Andy Buckley tell me what had been happening to him and all these people who were being made sick and running out of this magnificent formation, that when I listened to um, a friend of mine who comes from Holland who was there with his wife, and they were up on, the, on Woodboro Hill, the Wednesday, July uh, 18th, when they saw themselves, these big helicopters 
coming over Woodboro Hill, and they saw two projectiles. Of, uh, they, uh, Coutier, uh, he described them as projectiles that came out of the helicopters. This is what Andy saw as the pink smoke. And people have gone into those fields between Woodboro Hill and Eastfield looking for, well, where are these projectiles? Where were they? And this is the first time on record by anyone that I know, that Andy knows, that Charles knows, that anybody who's been going into England so many years now for the beauty of the crop formations, this is the first time the entire group knows that anything this aggressive, including projectiles being fired out of helicopters, at what? And now, let's jump back for just a second. Andy Buckley, about five years ago, had somebody tell him off the record, not officially, that the British government working with the United States government had all kinds of helicopters that were armed with infrared cameras that could operate in videotape and in still frames and that they were searching for the mysterious lights. They chased the mysterious lights that were linked to crop formations because they were considered a threat to national security. That phrase, Whitley, is becoming an enemy of all humans. National there's, nothing, there's nothing they can do to stop this. It's a ridiculous, stupid effort. There's a whole lot of things they could do to make it work when, as it unfolds. It will not stop unfolding. They will not stop it. As long as they do this, they are like a stone in the rapids. All they do is change the flow and perhaps the aesthetic of the flow is going to be less useful to us because they were there. They have nothing good to offer, nothing. And what will the crop formation makers do next if the East Field came on July 7th, 2007, and in all of the previous years, between the middle of July and the middle of August, there has always been a grand finale. There is a man in Australia that you and I and a few others have corresponded with. He is convinced that the East Field pattern relates to lunar cycles. And he is expecting that there will be some kind of an event on this planet on or before August 18th of 2007 based on his analysis of crop formation. We'll see. And yes, I'm very familiar with that work. And, Linda, we have come to the end of our time together. Uh, Linda Moulton Howe, uh, this, we will be on, as you know, we will be on hiatus next week while Anne and I go searching through the country where the drones have been seen to see what we can see, if anything, loaded, as you may imagine, with cameras. This is Whitley Strieber. Mr. Jerry E. Smith, he along with a George Picard, are the authors of a new book out now called Secrets of the Holy Land. The Spear of Destiny in History and Legend. And uh, Jerry is a writer, editor, an activist. Uh, he was close uh, associate of Jim Keith, uh, the author of Black Helicopters Over America, Strike Force for a New World Order, uh, and several other uh, conspiracy books. Uh, Jerry, I'm, it's a real pleasure to have you with me here today. Uh, tell me real briefly, if you could, what, what got your particular interest aroused uh, regarding the uh, Heilige Holy Land? Right, uh, Heilige Lanza. Heilige uh, Lanza. Yeah, uh, well, I read Trevor Ravenscroft's book when, when it first, uh, first came out back in the early 70s and was impressed with it. And curiously enough, I was actually in a monastery at the time I read it, so it was uh the uh, the uh, the occult and and past life stuff was was very real to me at the time and so uh i i kind of filed it away and then um uh i uh, i'm uh, one of the writers for adventures unlimited press and uh, our uh, owner david hatcher childress called me up one day while i was working on on my current newest book which is weather warfare the military's plan to draft mother nature and i had been working on that book for a number of years and that book was like seven years in the research and two years in the writing 
And I'm going to be I very, very inter- I'm going to be very interesting to interested to talk with you about that because I was writing about weather modification back in the seventies, and you can imagine how advanced they are with it now. And like right oh, here absolutely. in Texas this summer, you know, it's uh, here it is almost July the fourth, and it should be hot and dry, and instead it's rained for a month. It's uh, very, very unusual. Yeah, actually, uh, I believe that that is uh, the telltale of. A, uh, a hurricane prevention shield that was thrown up last year, which is why we had zero hurricanes hit the U.S., and I think we're going to have the same thing this year. But the problem is, in order to make the, the shield work, you have to have a persistent dome of high pressure, which inside the high pressure you get uh, um, hot baking conditions, and outside clearly could not have been used in the crucifixion. Right. Now, the, well, the, the wild but... twist on this is that, according to Howard Buchner, that the, uh, uh, Heinrich Himmler had um, uh, Japan's greatest swords maker come to Germany during the war and make an exact replica of the real spear and had it intentionally made out of Carolingian era materials so that if ever tested it would prove to be bogus. Uh, this, uh, this I think is a wild twist and, and Buchner said this in the 70s um, you know, he wrote in, uh, excuse me, in the 80s. He wrote in 89, 88, 89, and it wasn't until 2003 that it was tested and proven to be Carolingian in origin. Fascinating. I think we should break right here, though. I should have done this earlier. For those listeners who might not have a clear understanding of exactly what the Holy Lance or the Spear of Destiny is, why don't you give us a synopsis of uh, exactly what we're talking about here? Okay, according to the Gospel of John, as Jesus hung on the cross, uh, the uh, soldiers were sent to break their legs so as to hasten their death. And the soldiers broke the legs of the two common criminals and came to break Jesus' legs. And at that point, a centurion stepped forward and pierced his side with, the, with his spear. And according to John, out came blood and water. Uh, a Christian mythology has grown up around this thing and said that the... Uh, the, the centurion uh, was Gaius Cassius Longinus, or Longinus. He uh, was an elderly man, uh, had, had, was, had, had cataracts, was going blind, and was on light duty, basically Red Squad deal of, of following Jesus around and reporting back to Pontius Pilate on his activities, and had come to appreciate, perhaps even even worship, uh, Jesus. And when, uh, when uh, uh, Jesus was already dead and... and uh, uh, Gaius Cassius Longinus or Longinus had stepped forward to show that he was dead so you don't have to break his legs, so you don't have to mutilate the body, which is a, a, an act of disrespect. And in doing that, piercing the side of Christ, out came the blood and water, which cured him of his cataracts and converted him to Christianity at that very moment. Now, a, a, um, a legend, died, you get... Uh, uh, weather system stalled, and so the weather systems that should be passing over Texas, dropping a few sprinkles, are um, are being stopped and and uh, and emptied before they can move on. Oh, so uh, anyhow, um, I yeah, moving you, you back to the about, uh, line. <laughs> Yes. So uh, uh, David uh, David gave me a call uh, September '05. No, September '04. And said, "Hey, um, uh, I've been selling these two books by by Howard Buchner, and I've been selling these two books by uh, um, uh, uh, Ravenscroft, and I'd like to just get rid of all of them and have one book that combines them all into one book. Can you do that for me?" And I said, "Geez, wow, that sounds like a great plan. Uh, sure, I'd be happy to." And he said, "Great, I want it in six months." And, uh, and uh, it took me two years to write my first book for this company, which was Harp, the Ultimate Weapon of the Conspiracy. And I knew there was no right. chance I could I could crank out a book in six months. So I, I immediately uh, uh, tagged George Picard. George Picard is a uh, CIA mind control operation paperclip expert. He wrote Liquid Conspiracy, the CIA Area 51 UFOs and LSD. And uh, I, uh, I got him to write the Nazi segments, and then I wrote the uh, the ancient history and the uh, and the urban legends about the, the Antarctic base uh, around his writing about the Nazis. Well, I got, I have to say that you've done a commendable job here. This uh, 
uh, your book is all over the map. It goes all the way back to Tubal Cain. It comes all the way forward to uh, 9/11. Uh, it's it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, so how much collectively? How much time did it take you all to put that together? Well, David gave me six months, and I had the manuscript to him in seven. So wow. uh, George and I each spent about six months on our halves. So it took collectively about 14 months to, to, to write a book and deliver it in, four, in, in seven. Well, you've done a very commendable job, and I might add that it's a very readable book, too. I mean, uh, but you certainly cover all bases. Um, my question, my first question is, is... Um, do you, do you have any hard evidence that Charmaine possessed the Spear of Destiny? Charlemagne. Um, Charlemagne. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, the, the hardest evidence is that um, uh, both we have uh, eyewitness accounts. Uh, uh, the uh, the Bishop of Tours wrote it at, at great length. And then we have um, uh, the hardest of hard evidence. We have coins that show Charlemagne with uh, the the spear of destiny, uh-huh. uh, that it's I think clearly is clearly identifiable. Is, it's identifiable. Oh yeah, yeah. Right. Okay. And, yeah, and, yeah. and uh, uh, he made it very uh, very pointedly a big piece of his reign, and partly because Charlemagne, as the king of the of the Franks, had had sub- uh, the the Franks were uh, the the people who eventually gave us France and Germany today. The Frankish people were two major divisions of the Frankish people, the, the Merovingians and the Carolingians. And right. Charlemagne was the king of the Carolingians, and the, he fought and defeated the king of the uh, Merovingians. And uh, if you're, I know you, you know a, a lot of the wild stories about the Merovingians. They, they oh, claimed yeah. to be descend, descended from Jesus. And they had, uh, the king of the Merovingians had a tribal spear, that is that when he possessed it, it gave him the power of life or death over any Frank. And Charlemagne came up with the Jesus spear, which trumped the um, the, the the Merovingian tribal spear. And wow. I, I, my best guess is that the the object that is in Vienna today uh, is probably, almost certainly, Charlemagne's spear, and Charlemagne hoaxed the world by saying it was the Jesus spear. Uh, he, in fabric- he fabricated one, right? Exactly, exactly. Because uh-huh. there had been, there had been a, a Jesus spear in the in the in the Byzantine Empire. It, it existed from Constantine to Justinian, and then vanished for several hundred years. And then it well, turns up uh, with, uh, with with Charlemagne. And uh, uh-huh. in two in two thousand and three. The British metallurgist Dr. Robert Feather was permitted to test the the Vienna artifact, and he concluded that it was in fact a a Carolingian winged spear that had been forged in the sixth or seventh century. It has arisen that whoever possesses this holy lance and understands the powers it serves holds in his hands the destiny of the world for good or evil. Either way. So, in other words, Longinus's action was one of mercy, perhaps even love. Exactly. And uh, and uh, uh, there is a uh, uh, this makes this makes the the spear a relic of the passion. And relics are a universal constant. Virtually every religion on this planet reveres relics. And the, and and the idea of a relic that has somewhat dropped out in Christianity. We don't have them have have them quite as important as they were say a thousand years ago but uh the the idea is that the relic is not merely a memento of the saint or prophet but is uh, but that but the, the that which made the saint or prophet uh into the saint is is the supernatural and the the uh uh the idea here is that is that you visit the the shrine of a saint in hopes that that some of that supernatural power that made him a saint will come through and positively affect you. And so it's believed that this that this spear, because it pierced the side of Christ, is imbued with the supernatural power, and that it can be wielded by uh, by someone who understands how to do it. Right. I think the key there, though, is can be wielded for good or for evil. And we'll get into that. Uh, 
and right after these messages. Under no circumstances miss Linda Howe's report at the end of this program. It is also offered as a special report in position 5 in our Windows Media Player. Do not miss it. It is a terribly important report on the crop circle phenomenon, probably the most important report on this phenomenon that anyone has ever done. Do not miss this. Howdy, this is Jim Mars, and we're back here on Dreamland talking with Jerry Smith about the Heile Galant or the Holy Spear or the Spear of Destiny. Um, and Jerry and his co-author, uh, George Picard, have uh, made a intensive study of this, and if you have any interest, I would highly recommend uh, their book, The Secrets 